Our speaker today is Catherine Flanagan of the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is affiliated with Johns Hopkins University. Um, they have been involved not just in the James Webb uh, Observatory, but with the Hubble Telescope. And uh, they've been in the thick of things for quite a while with regard to the satellites and the observations uh, based therein of the universe. By the way, I might say, for those of you who are too young to know, um, yeah. James, we know who James Webb was. Yeah, he was, he was the director of NASA when, when they set it up uh, and he guided it through at least the Apollo and, uh, and gave it the kind of structure that it has today. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak. It's a real honor, I have to say, and I'm really shocked at how many of you there are in the audience. Uh, I was hoping it would be a little informal. <laughs> As you can see, this laptop, which is now the third iteration of machines, has crashed repeatedly on Keynote, so I'm going to learn PowerPoint today. I decided to make it, and so far it hasn't crashed. <laughs> so uh, a lot of what you're going to see here is what I call eye candy. You know, there's movies and there's stuff, and the reason for that is because I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we do the science operations for Hubble, and Hubble has become sort of a brand name around the world these days, and part of it's because it delivers eye candy. So we have a group of um, professionals who actually pay attention to how they present, you know, science to the public, and I would be shot at dawn if I didn't use their products. <laughs> so the, all the eye candy is made by someone else. I Trust me on this one. All errors are mine and all factual content I got from somebody else. So I, I'd like to talk to you about James Webb. Um, my history with Webb actually, James Webb Space Telescope, the concept for this mission that is going to launch, it's literally the next big thing. Um, quite literally, it is the largest astrophysics mission in NASA's history, and it's going to launch in about 2021. Uh, maybe a little sooner, but we're baselining March 30th, 2021. Um, I was invited, I was an X-ray astronomer at MIT. I get a phone call, could you apply for this job? And I said, what is it? And they said, well, it's mission head for James Webb. And I said, you know, it's an infrared mission, right? And I'm an x-ray girl. And they said, yeah, we know. And so I applied, and oddly, they offered me the job. Go figure. Nobody knew me. It probably makes sense then. Um, so what turns out was I walked into this infrared environment with a mission that is a, an optic very different from what I'm used to, technology very different from what I'm used to, but I'm very used to the great observatories of NASA, and I know what, what to expect. And the hope is, and the expectation is, that this is going to deliver the same impactful science that Chandra, Spitzer, and Hubble have given us. And so that's why I want to talk about it today. So this is the slide that I can't get away with not putting in there, because I have to tell you who all the players are before I give you sort of my perspective of what I want to you know, describe. It's, we will get down to the description of the, um, the telescope or the observatory soon. This is what it looks like, very iconic. And you and I together will design why it needs to look like that. A little bit strange looking, but all of that will make sense shortly. However, it is a NASA mission, NASA led, but we have two international partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, and we all work hand in glove to get this to work. It is managed by Goddard Space Flight Center, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, it also delivers some of the hardware. The prime contractor from industry is Northrop Grumman, which is in California. I worked with the same folks on um, <coughs> James Webb, which we call JWST. I worked with the, these same individuals, some of them on Chandra, uh, the decade or so, two decades earlier. And there are four science instruments. Oh, I would need to mention our role in this. I'm from the Space Telescope Science Institute, formerly located in Baltimore. They're allowing me to work remotely up here because I intend to retire here. This is where home is. And so we have a deal going. Um, let me, let me uh, go back one. So I work at Space Telescope, but the thing about Space Telescope is we do the science operations for Hubble, and we will do both the mission operations in-house and the science operations, meaning we will relay the commands up to the observatory, orient it. Uh, we will run the science competition to see who gets to observe, and we will help to enable the worldwide users to be able to use the observatory. 
And there are four science instruments. I won't go into detail much about this. One is called NearCam, which uh, is going to give you wonderful in near infrared, N-I-R means near infrared camera, uh, wonderful near infrared images, uh, among other things. Um, we have the near infrared spectrograph, near spec, which is really quite an awesome uh, spectrometer. I'll describe what a spectrometer is shortly. In fact, if you don't mind, I'll pass these around. I want you guys to go ahead and hold this up to light so you can see what a, remind yourself what a spectrum is. You can pass that out. And I have two lasers here. One's green and one's red. You'll, if you actually shine these through, you can pass this around, you'll see that it disperses colors at different distances. Okay, and the mid-infrared infra instrument, as you can see, it's, we're now no longer talking near cam, but mid-infrared, which is a little bit longer wavelength, also will give us spectacular images, but in a different wavelength, which shows us different physics going on. And NEARIS, the Near Infrared Im Imager and Splitless Spectrograph from the Canadian Space Agency. Okay, so I won't describe the instruments much, but I will describe the science, and you and I together will design this observatory to do a job. Okay, James Webb. Everybody knows him differently. You are right to describe him as the administrator of NASA in the days in the Kennedy era, basically, where we, he said we will get to the moon in this decade and we will do basically hard things because they are hard and it will organize our efforts. And it's transformed the space, the space community, it's transformed the nation in terms of science. Uh, but what's interesting about Webb and the reason I appreciate him, all of, I'm, a, I'm from the space community, all of our missions are named after scientists. Chandra was named after Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, right? Uh, so who is this James Webb guy? <laughs> well, he put the science in NASA. We really owe him. Because he argued to the president that you have to have science as well as exploration as part of NASA. And the reason that it is strategically valuable is it will help drive the universities and the aerospace industry towards the excellence that we need from it. And so he put the science in NASA. I'm grateful. And I'm glad it's named after James Webb. What was the uh, yep. head of NASA? What, Sorry? What, what years was he head of NASA? Uh, 62 to 68, I believe, right around in there. And th th in those days, of course, the budget for, for NASA was a, a, a real fraction of the federal budget to get to the moon in a decade. Yeah. I'm lucky if I can paint my house in a decade, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting, do you know what the fraction of the federal budget is that goes to NASA today? Wild guess. One percent. Very close. Four tenths of a percent. Not bad, right? Did somebody else have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my boss down in Houston. So the Johnson Space Center. Yes. In fact, we we're going to mention Johnson shortly. It has a big role right now. Yeah. Yeah. In Web. Yep. It's where the Apollo tests. Yes. They we use a chamber from the Apollo the Apollo test chamber vacuum chamber because it's the only one big enough in the world for us to test James Webb. How do you like that? They had to refurbish it, clean it, get it back online. Kind of historic, but kind of appropriate too, right? So I want to talk to you a bit about light, all right? We're, this is visible light. It's all the colors of the spectrum. Short wavelength is blue. If you look through those, those gratings I gave you, you'll see blue and you'll see red and you'll see the colors in between. This is considered short wavelength and this is considered long wavelength. This is what our eyes see really convenient because this is what comes through the atmosphere, so no wonder we see it. However, it's just a small fraction of what light really is. Light is all kinds of wavelengths, including stuff we can't see. So if I took visible light and somehow shifted it this way, it would become <coughs> ultraviolet, UV. If I took visible light somehow and shifted it this way, it would become infrared, all right? And the reason I mention that is we're familiar with radio waves, infrared, microwave, infrared is a heat signature, okay, a night vision goggles based on infrared. Ultraviolet, x-rays, we all know what x-rays are, gamma rays. We don't see anything but this, but that doesn't mean that's all there is. In fact, snakes, some snakes can see infrared or sense infrared. How convenient if you want to get that mouse in the dead of night in a cold desert, right? And some bumblebees can see ultraviolet. 
Okay, now why am I mentioning this? Because obviously it's a setup for something we need later. All right, let us now together design the type of machine that will show us the furthest galaxy we can possibly get to. Get to meaning see, detect. All right, I want to look at the first galaxies. So I've got to think about the problem. If I go out in my backyard, I can look up in the night sky and I can see the Milky Way, you know. Lovely, beautiful, that's our galaxy. We're in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way and we can see it in the night sky. So our eyes can detect pretty well. But if I want to actually see distant galaxies, it's a harder problem and it's going to be pretty faint. Even the Milky Way is hard to see in the city because there's so much background light, which is some of us call light pollution. <laughs> it's nice to read by, but it's not good just for the night sky. So we're going to have to think about that visible light pollution problem in a minute if we want to see a distant galaxy. So if I want to see a distant galaxy, I've got to think about it. It's full of stars. We know what stars look like. We know what color they are. Stars are the colors that we saw, right? We can see our own sun. That's yellowish. Uh, actually, stars are a little bit ultraviolet also. So they're kind of... Ultraviolet to visible would be a good thing. So we'd probably want to make our machine to look at a distant galaxy, maybe. We'd be thinking it'll be optimized for visible, maybe bluish light, who knows. Are those accurate colors or are those tuned for a picture? And it's going to be on slides. Uh, I can describe how they do that shortly. Okay. But we actually do an RGB equivalent and these uh, by selecting three filters. And I'll describe. That's a technique mastered by Zolt LeVay that they use a lot, and I'll describe a little bit afterwards if that's okay. Remember that, though, because that's a really great question. Okay, so I want to look at a distant galaxy, and I'm thinking I'm going to look at it in visible light, and it's going to be distant, so it's going to be faint. So I better have a big optic to capture a lot of light so I can detect that thing because it's faint. And, and it's got a lot of light pollution. So probably I'll need some kind of protection against the light pollution. So those are the elements we want to think about. And I said I wanted to show you the farthest galaxy. I want to see the farthest galaxy. So how do we do that? Well, you may recall that the universe is actually, our universe, started in a big bang. All this stuff jumbled up, gets going, create galaxies form, okay? And the galaxies are like little I don't know, stickers or dots on the surface of a balloon. As the balloon expands, all the galaxies get farther and farther apart. Okay? So my distant galaxy is going to be, I want the first galaxy. Oh, I'm sorry, I want the first in the universe seeable galaxy, period. I'm going to design my machine to see that galaxy, not just any old one. So how do I do that? It turns out we've been expanding for 13.7 billion years. So I had better look at a galaxy that's 13.7 billion light years away or so. Maybe galaxies weren't immediately formed, but as soon after as possible. That's what I'm shooting for. Okay. We may have a little problem, though, with my design. Let's take a quick look. These are my galaxies. I'm here. And the light from the galaxy I want, I'm say I'm here maybe, and the light from the galaxy is there. I forget. That galaxy's letting light go. It starts out bluish like we said, but by the time it hits my detector or my observatory, the expanding space has changed the wavelength. It started out bluish like we expect, but it ended up reddish. So I better have a machine that looks at red light. In fact, this is what we call redshift. The normal galaxy spectrum is going to be redshifted. And in fact, it's going to be redshifted right into the infrared. OK? So one detail, I better make an infrared machine, not a detector for looking at infrared light, not for looking at visible light, if I want to do it right. So it better be infrared. We've designed that. You better have a big mirror because these are faint. It's so far, I mean, it's really edge of the universe, right? And I'm probably going to need a sun shield. Why a sun shield? Well, it's a parasol, right? But basically, 
The lovely sun and the earth and the moon, visible and beautiful in the night sky, are a real pain if I'm looking at a faint infrared signal out there. So I'd really like to line them up behind me, put a shield there, and make sure my mirror is in the shadow in the dark without any annoying sources of noise. So these are the three elements I'm going to build into my observatory if I want to see the first galaxies. Yep. Why do you stop at infrared? You don't have to stop. I'm saying, you know, it, conceivably the, the good stuff is even further out on the spectrum. So we did the calculation, right? Estimating the, the how much would it be redshifted if I was at the very edge of the universe. And we do the math, and we know what a normal star looks like in a normal galaxy because we live in one, or we assume we do. We are mm -hmm. the virtual definition of normal, after all. <laughs> <laughs> and then we redshifted it out. Oh. Okay, and that's so it's you do that calculation for the, for, right. for the expansion. Yeah. Is, is there a particular uh, spectral line, like hydrogen or something, that you're looking for being redshifted, and where does that line start out? So all of them, all of them will be redshifted. Yes, very smart. All of them will be redshifted, right. but there is a signature line, and that's one of the ways that you can actually tell by looking at a whole slew of galaxies. Look for the signature line and find out where it shows up on a redshift scale, and you can, um, in fact, I'm proposing maybe that we would do something like that with Webb. Take a look at a field with a bunch of galaxies and have kids. Look at the line, if we have a spectrum of each one, figure out where it is, how, how distant is that galaxy based on its redshift. So that's, a good, that's a, an idea of what we're thinking of. So, so okay, we kind of have a design. We've got a working design. It's infrared, big mirror, sun shield. I got to do a couple of tricks. The sun shield I have to orient correctly so that that annoying earth, moon, and sun is on this side of it. It stays in the shadow on that side of it. I got to figure out it's got to be big. We're going to just show you what big means in a minute. But we have a design, which, and it's designed to look at the early, well, I call it the early universe, the galaxies that are the most distant. Now. Before I go any farther, there's a trick about this galaxies. If I send out a note in a bottle, it's going to be news of the day. But it's discovered 100 years later, I could be saying McKinley just got elected, right? <laughs> right? So light from this distant galaxy, by the time it gets to me, it's been traveling for 13 billion years. I'm seeing that galaxy right after the Big Bang. And if I look at one slightly closer, maybe 12 billion years ago it started, I'm seeing that galaxy a billion years after the Big Bang. And as I come closer and closer, the local environment I'm seeing now, 13.7 years after the Big Bang. Because I'm getting light that was sent in that bottle all that distant time ago. I don't know what the galaxy looks like now, but I will know what it looked like then. And why do I care? Because I want to know what our galaxy looked like then, or any galaxy. What are the earliest galaxies like? The ones that formed right after the Big Bang. And the only way I can tell that is by looking at the farthest ones away, because they have the oldest <coughs> images to, to send me. So. My machine, which is going to look at the distant galaxies, is really a time machine. It's going to show me all the galaxies at all the times from the beginning until now. I can see how they changed over time. I can see what happened to them. I can see how we got the way we are, normal though we are. All right. So, trick. I need to get my parasol just right. I need to get my sun shield. How am I going to do that? So let me grab... Uh, a couple of little gratings for the second, just as an illustration. I've got the sun. Let's say I'm the sun. I'm this big, massive body, and I've got the Earth rotating around me. I would really, I'm going to look for a, a place to put this satellite well outside the Earth, above the Earth, such that no matter what happens, I always have sun, Earth, satellite, observatory. That way I can put my parasol in between and always keep the Earth and the Sun and the Moon, which is pretty local to the Earth, all that behind the, behind the Sun Shield. Well, there is a gravitational point for that. 
it turns out that the Earth and the Sun, and the Moon is a little satellite around the Earth, can be lined up. <coughs> so if you like a centrifugal force, I could put a satellite just beyond that, and the three would stay lined up together gravitationally. It's a gravitationally preferred point called Lagrange point two, or L2. It just so happens if you put the sun here, you put the earth here, the moon goes around it, you gotta stick a satellite way out there, a million miles out there approximately. But if you do that, it will stay kind of in a line, even when the earth goes around the sun, it stays in line. Now that's convenient, because then I can put the sun shade here, and I guarantee moon sh moonlight, earthlight, Sunlight all behind my shade. Yes? Is it a stable point or does it need to be continuously controlled? <laughs> Very smart. It's, ca it's called a saddle point. It's not stable. Mm -hmm. So the observatory is going to be there, but it's going to be doing this a little and we're going to have to tweak it all the time. It's a more subtle problem than that. <laughs> You're obviously very, very smart. It's more subtle than that because even light provides light pressure. Oh. I've got a big mother sun shield and light on it. What if it tweaks? We're going to have to put a momentum flap there to help. Mo so it's complicated. But it's a place to be these days, L2. I'm telling you, take out real estate now. <laughs> is okay. This, is yep. there a solar wind problem, too? Uh, maybe. <coughs> I don't know enough to be able to tell you. But you will when it's launched. <laughs> yes. How many other things are there in L2 these days? Well, they're, they're getting more and more. It's, uh, when I say it's the place to go, I'm not fooling. Um, L2 has a lot of advantages, a few disadvantages. You can't service it. So Hubble is in a low Earth orbit, less than 600 miles or so above the Earth, which is kind of close. Um, so human beings could get to it and service it. L2 is a million miles. That's, that's a whole different ballgame. And so it can't be serviced at the moment, although we can imagine techniques that that might happen where you, you bring it in or, or where you autonomously service it with a robot. Um, communication can be difficult. When you're above the Earth, you can download your data all over the place. Chandra, for example, is in a high Earth orbit. Um, it downloads at three different ground stations. But this, is a, this, this can be another potential issue. So, Pluses and minuses, the pluses, it depends on the science mission that you're trying to do, what the advantages are. The advantages of keeping out the sunlight and the uh, contaminating radiation from contaminating radiation that we take, you know, that we enjoy so much, um, that actually defined, gave you a reason to the, that you wanted to go to L2. And there are other reasons why other missions might want to. Is the sun shield blocking infrared also? Yes, it should. Now, I'm going to show you something interesting. It, there are other things that it'll do, lots of things. But we made five of them that separate out. I'll show you in a minute, and there's a good reason for that, too. OK, so when I say big, I wanted to give you an idea of big. You'll notice James Webb has these hexagonal mirror segments all, all assembled together. It's not because we can't make a mirror that large. We can. We just can't launch it yet. And so if you're going to make it into an origami telescope and fold it up, you want to segment it, OK? And so actually, literally, they folded up the mirror. They took away the secondary. They folded up the sun shield, squashed the thing into an Ariane 5 rocket provided by ESA. That's how they're going to launch it, a million miles away, 40 degrees Kelvin. And they're going to deploy it. You better believe I was nervous when I read about this before the job interview. <laughs> but I was so certain I wouldn't get the job, I just relaxed and really enjoyed it. <laughs> OK, so that's what big means. All right, this is a deployment video just to show you how it's going gonna, it's gonna to take about a month to get to L2. You have communication, you have solar panels, and now they're taking down the sun shields, and they're going to slowly stretch it out. I think Northrop made this video. Uh -huh. There may be minor details that have changed, but I. But this is the basic idea. Now notice, I told you there were five of them. Notice they're starting to separate out. Why would you put five? If you had a meteor, you would really hate 
to have just one and punch a hole in it because then you have a direct path to the mirror, right? So why wouldn't the meteor go through all five? It might. That would be bad. I would really not like that. Okay. How thick is the individual sheets? Very thin. Um, I don't remember exactly, but they are very thin. And they're, you have to be, we had to test them to make sure they're not going to tear and do all So they don't things. offer all that much protection physically. The meteor that's no. coming in and no. whatever. Right. Going back yes. to that big rocket. Yes. Can you compare it relatively, say, to the Saturn IV rocket? Oh, I should be able to, but I'm sorry, I don't, I don't personally know, but I can Is look it that stage up. Is it several stage rockets? It's in several stages, right? Yeah, it's several stages, and there will be three course corrections at least of the uh, observatory itself on the way to L2. Thank you. Um, I don't know how big it is, but I will tell you this. This is an interesting factoid, if true. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, but I mean, this thing is huge. I'll show you pictures. I mean, it's really amazing. But if you take the entire bay that they jammed it into in the Ariane and the, the entire mass of JWST, it's actually less dense than styrofoam. We've actually done a lot of work to lightweight this observatory for obvious reasons. Is it a new rocket or is it already in the existing inventory? Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's certainly in the ESA line and has they have several flights. In, in the one. NASA culture these days, it's not a good idea to take your $8 billion observatory and try it out on a new rocket. Consider us old fashioned. <laughs> I think they used the same rocket to launch the Bepi Colombo. Bepi Colombo, yes. In fact, we were, we were, it was a competition of whether we would launch then or they would, uh, but we're not really ready. Okay, so what you've got is you've got your sun shield, as we pointed out. You've got your mirror, six and a half meters, 21 feet across. You got your science instruments. What happens is the light comes in on the optic here. It bounces up to the secondary mirror. It bounces from that mirror in through this little inlet port goes all the way in and now it's get collected by science instruments on the back side. And you have on the flip side there, uh, this is looking, you have solar panels which we saw deploy spacecraft and this is the momentum flap or the trim flap for ma managing the uh, light radiation, light pressure. Okay, there is a good idea. Whoa. These are actual real people <laughs> and this is a, a model of James Webb. And this is just a few of us uh, a couple of years ago to give you an idea of it. But now you have an idea of the size. It's several stories high. I don't personally play tennis, but this is as big as a tennis court. We're not fooling. When we say the biggest astrophysics mission, we're not, we're not kidding. So it's actually a, you know, its own special set of problems, if you like. So I told you that infrared was really good if what we want to do is see the distant, distant universe, the early universe. But it has one other really good property that we're going to use on this observatory. This is an example I found on the web called Thermal Imaging. This was uh, published in an SPIE paper, so there's the reference. Here's this guy behind a trash bag. I don't know if he wears glasses. I don't know if he's sticking his tongue out. Can't see it because the visible light is occluded by the trash bag. However, if he leaves the trash bag on and I use an infrared camera, a camera sensitive to the infrared, I can actually see through the thing and see what's behind it. So I can actually see behind some of that stuff that obscures the visible view. And that means that infrared light might penetrate obscuring layers. Infrared light might get through dust. Infrared light might shine through areas that I can't see with Hubble or can't see with backyard telescopes. So infrared, the second great property that we're going to exploit is infrared's going to let us look at areas that are otherwise occluded or dusty. Okay? So let's take a look at what kind of science that gives us. This is an iconic image of Hubble called the Pillars of Creation. You can see gorgeous lanes of dust. How do I know they're dust? Because I can't see much through them. I can't see what I would normally expect to see stars, but it obviously is some kind of three-dimensional pillar that I can almost feel like I can put my fingers on. But if I wanted to see what was going on inside the dust or behind the dust, I would need to look in the infrared. What, what is the what size like. of what we're looking at? Um, arc minute size, but I think maybe even smaller. We can look that up. 
Okay, this is the Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula, so we can just look that up online. So I, want, I wanted to show you, this was basically visible. This is infrared. And what you are seeing is you can now see easily the stars not only behind, but if there are stars in the dust, stars forming from the dust and the gas, you will now see them. Now, what I see also is I still see some obscuration. You will find, I believe, that if you go into the mid-infrared, this is near-infrared, if you go to the mid-infrared, the dust will start to glow. So it's, it's going to be pretty awesome, actually. And it shows you different physics. Here's an example. Infrared, nothing but a big black blob. Sorry. Uh, a visible big black bob, blob. Infrared. Color, structure, maybe there's a jet there. You can see different physics because you get to access a different wavelength. Here's another one. Completely different. Gorgeous, actually. Notice the stuff that's, that's obscured here. Here it's obscured, here it's luminous. I told you if we look at longer wavelengths, sometimes the dust actually lights up. So the infrared capability really gives us a second great tool for this observatory. So what are we going to do with it? Well, think about how stars form. Stars form from gas, hydrogen that you know gravitationally binds together and sets off fusion. And this is a, uh, a, star, uh, a simulation of a a star formation, a, a nascent star being born, may have some, has some jets here, and with angular momentum you get the stuff around it creating a torus or a disk, and so this is a um, disk of dust. So this is a paradigm maybe of how our own solar system came to be. And what happens in the disk is planets form. Now we haven't been lucky enough to see a planet being born because, hint, hint, it's in a dusty environment. Can't see into the dusty environment. But with infrared, we might be able to get there. So we actually have an awesome tool to not only look at the old universe and galaxies, but to look at star forming and planet forming regions. So we've got four things that we can do, killer apps, the four themes, as I call it, for James Webb, OK? First light, I call it first lights, the first, quite literally, the first galaxies that the universe has formed and whose light can penetrate um, through to be detected. So that I call first light. Galaxy assembly, we know we're going to see all those galaxies from the very distant universe to the local environment, and those are telling us what galaxies looked like at various stages of development. We're going to see how they assembled. We're going to see star and planet formation. And maybe, 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 we would be able to actually try to characterize what is called an exoplanet. An exoplanet is a planet around a star other than our own sun. If it's our sun, we're special. <laughs> our planets are called planets. <laughs> other stars are not so special. Their planets are called exoplanets. <laughs> okay. So the, the, it would be lovely to actually see what's going on in a planet around another star. So these are four interesting themes for sure that we can do with James Webb. And I guarantee you we'll do probably 100 things we haven't thought of. When, when you um, show these pictures, if you will, is that what's uh, happening with the reflector, or is the reflector a single point and you have to move it, the point to get a picture? Is it, is it a sensor that's one inch by one inch, or how does it work? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand your question. I have a 21-foot mirror that gathers the light, puts it on a detector. Is it a point source, or is it actually a picture that it's taking? It's taking a picture. It's got a, it's a, it's a camera, okay, Merkad Telluride, for example, mm -hmm. with many pixels, and it takes a picture of what it's seeing. If what I have is a point source, it'll show up as a point source. If what I have is a nebulous cloud, I'll see the whole nebulous cloud laid out here. Because, if you think about it, that nebula is comprised of many different points of light, all of which get focused. And uh, how do you... Get it. What type of beam is it? How, what degree, how number of degrees is it? Um, the, it, it, good question. That's the same thing as the field of view. How, how much can it see? Yeah. And a lot of that depends a bit on the detector, the size of the detector. I don't, I don't have the slide showing, but a typical size that the detector will allow you to see is a few arc minutes. 
an arc minute would be one sixth the, uh, an arc minute is uh, much less than a degree, much, much, much less. Okay, I, I can figure out exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, when you're talking about assembly and formation and so forth, you talk about some sort of a time scale, something yes. going on during yes. some time. Yes. How are you going to be able to hold on to that during that period of time? Or is it that you're assembling different pictures from different places and putting them together? I won't see the same galaxy at different times. I'll see different galaxies at various <laughs> times. However distant they are, that's the, uh, that'll be, maybe I'll see a bunch of them and I'll say, the average galaxy, 13 billion years ago looks like this. I know today they're only, you know, what the average galaxy looks like. That's pretty easy. We have pictures of those. And so what we would do is we would look at them at various times just to see in general how they changed, okay? <coughs> so the pictures I've seen of the early universe galaxies look a lot like something you'd find in a cat litter box. They're kind of not gorgeous. <laughs> Could be the picture, you know, a beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but it's kind of clear that things happened to change them to the way that we see them today, and we'll look at that in a minute. Yeah. Yep. I have a technical question. Uh, you showed on the uh, simulation how the mirror actually uh, assembles itself. Now, yes, so that's always good in, I don't know what I'm asking. <laughs> I think you're going to ask how we focus in, it. With all these segmented mirrors we have yes. on the ground here, yes. there's a big issue how to align them to get yes. the bigger figure. Yes. What techniques are you going to use up there? Very smart question. Question one and question two, you are in an L2 point. You yes. want to shield the spacecraft from the, earth, from the sun, Yes. but you have a solar panel on that. Yes. How does that work? Uh, that, the solar panel's on and the, the back side. Uh, behind the sun shield facing the sun. But you still have the sun basically shielded out by the shadow of the Earth. Okay. So you have the sun shield here, you have your telescope here in, the, in its shadow, but you have your solar panels on this side. So the L2 is just a particular stationary situation, yeah. not to shield the sun, basically. Well, it, it's enabling, because it guarantees that you can line up always okay. the observatory and the Earth and the sun in the same line. It guarantees that. And then what we did, I'll show, I can show you back a little bit, is we made sure to put the things that need the sun on the other. We were smart enough to put them on the right side of the <laughs> sun. I know about the Chris question, because yeah. that was a big problem, and there are tricky things to do. Yes, uh, the focus question? Right. Is the that what point you is what they need yes. to use to yes. line up these OK, so things. what we do, he was very right, and I didn't mention this. <clears throat> Figured you guys would catch me. I have 18 mirrors that have just done, I mean, uh, I've wanged on it the worst possible thing. It blew it up. And you sent it out and it's cold. Okay. So first of all, one of the tricks we did with the mirrors, we know they have to work when cold. When I say cold, mm -hmm. 40 degrees above absolute zero. We're not talking, you know, room temperature plus <laughs> chilled wine, right? We're not talking red wine. Um, we're not even talking liquid nitrogen. We're talking cold. So what we uh -huh. actually did was we took a mirror that was polished and good to go, good to go, took it down to Marshall Space Flight Center which has a cryogenic facility and chilled it down. Then we shined light off it to find out it, how it potato chipped, because that's what <coughs> it does. When you make it cold, it goes okay? And then we made what we called a hit map. What parts do we have to take out to make this a perfect mirror? We marked where those parts were, warmed it up, took it out, polished them off, brought it back, tested it, worked fine. So then we did all of the mirrors that way to make sure that they won't potato chip at L2. They could look crappy now, but it, what matters is what happens at L2 when it's cold. Second thing you do is you now have 18 mirrors that you put through the most hor horrendous experience, and you have to focus them. Well, each one is going to be sending light, you know, focusing like this, right? Turns out each one of them has, I think it's seven degrees of freedom. We have the ability to do rotation, tilt, all of that, and a little of this as well, okay? And what you do is you, you spot, find out where the spots are, and you tweak them, and you bring the spots together, and you tweak it again, you bring it together, and finally you bring it so they all come to a common focus. Then, every couple of weeks, you look at a point source and check, does it need retweaking? Because you're in a thermally changing environment, all kinds of things happen, and so what we plan on doing is monitoring the focus throughout. But, but you were right. Um, you actually have to focus it in space. It needs a lot of computer power to analyze the picture, which panel of us yeah. which. Uh, 
So we download the data and do it on Earth. So we don't try to do it. It's not resident and automatic. Time delay between your satellite and the ground? You yes. Can manage that. Yeah, it's not much though. It's only a million, it's, miles. Yeah. It's only a million miles, so it's not that bad. <laughs> it's only a million miles. miles. <laughs> <laughs> What's a million miles between friends? Okay, so let's take a quick look at how this is going to go. All right, what did the early universe look like? Here's a patch of sky with nothing much in it. Boring as hell, right? But what's interesting is if you look and look and look, which Hubble did, Hubble looked at a piece of boring sky through a, about the size of a drinking straw to see what was actually there if you look long and look hard. And the answer is mostly galaxies. You look, and if you look longer, you see galaxies, and then galaxies, and more galaxies. And that's called the Hubble Deep Field. In this case, this is a picture of the Ultra Deep Field. I want to see the distant galaxies, after all. Now I'm starting to get there. I'm in the Ultra Deep Field. I can see many galaxies. The red ones are probably redshifted, but there are some faint circles you see here. And each of those galaxies could have millions of stars, right? Oh, they do, yeah. <laughs> and these circles are candidate redshifted galaxies that are very distant. Take a look. Red dot looks, right? That is a distant galaxy. And so the ultra deep field shows us that there are distant galaxies. These are at redshift z equals 6, which is a billion years after the Big Bang. We want to see all those old galaxies. And what would we see? Hubble, this is a, an actual picture of Hubble. Hubble has great resolution, and you can see some galaxies in the background. This is what JWST will see. It has fantastic spatial resolution for infrared. And look at all the background information you can collect. Many more galaxies, much more clarity, very big optic, very big area. So it's the perfect machine because that's the way we designed it for this problem. So let's ask ourselves, what's the next theme? What does the shape of a galaxy, we're interested in the assembly of galaxies, what does the shape of a galaxy reveal to us? Well, these are simulations followed by actual Hubble images, OK? Here's a simulation of two galaxies colliding. Gravity is the thing that determines our shapes. And if you take the simulation compared to a Hubble image, we probably understand that galaxies, <coughs> to some degree, assemble by interacting also with other galaxies and helps determine their shape, their shape and normalize them. And so this is what we hope to discover by looking at galaxies that various stages of, the, of development. All right, let's take a look at the next one. <coughs> what, do you, what does it take to make a star or a planet? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It takes a really dusty environment. Is that dust mostly helium and hydrogen? Yes. The, 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 no, the gas is helium and hydrogen, but there is dust, and it usually comes from the explosion of former stars. Okay. In fact, we are conveniently located in an area that must have had a star go off in our neighborhood because that's probably the way we got enough oxygen to, for our planet to have oxygen. It's not formed here. See, stars, this is a star forming region. New stars are born in dusty regions, and that's what our observatory is going to show us. <coughs> Infrared and visible, obviously, very different. And then, what about? Planets, exoplanets. I'm going to talk to you briefly about TRAPPIST-1. Turns out we now know, and back in the day, you know, was there another planet out there and could it be habitable? We now know the average star has at least one planet. It's very, very common based on what we are, are knowing. Here's a system of a, of a star called TRAPPIST-1 that has seven known planets, seven. And it's a cool enough star that there, several of them are in what we call the habitable, habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, where water could remain liquid, not boil off, and not be frozen. Good environment. If we were to search for life, we'd probably want to look at a place like that. This is an artist illustration of all the seven particular planets. We're going to be very interested in these, in these and other exoplanets. Could James Webb help us figure out if one of them was habitable, so what would we need? What would we need to do? Well, I can tell you that if I want to see if there's water on it, I need to look for a signature of water. For example, 
I would love to be able to see a spectrum of the atmosphere of that planet. Here's a spectrum right here. This is the spectrum of the Earth's atmosphere, which we know has life. There's the blue sky. There's ozone and oxygen lines. Here's a jump. That's the signature of vegetation. Water vapor lines. Earthshine spectrum. Carbon dioxide and methane. All right, these are some of the features a spectrum in a habited, inhabited planet might show us. So, if we really want to understand those planets, it would be great to be able to take a spectrum of their atmosphere and see what's in that atmosphere. All right, so how do we do it? Well, planets go around their local sun, and you can detect them by seeing how the light changes. It, it bumps up or it goes away, etc. But it turns out that if you have a planet going in front of the sun, notice this fuzzy area here? That's the atmosphere. The light from its star is going through the atmosphere. And as you know, the atmosphere, if it has, say, oxygen in it, will absorb oxygen lines. And you will see a spectrum that comes through that's devoid, has a little absorption gap in the oxygen. If you actually take a look at the spectrum of that, that's coming through that planet, and there are a couple of techniques for doing that, you can surmise what elements are in it. You could look for water, you can look for oxygen, you can look for carbon dioxide. Useful technique. Hubble actually does this already. And so this is a simulation of what JWST might see if it did 20, 25 transits around uh, a, a particular type of star. And these are the features it might be able to see. Don't know. So that's a good concept, right? And what, so spectroscopy is the trick for going after a question like this. Here are three spectra um, of atmospheres from three planets in our own solar system. Obviously, they all three have big carbon dioxide lines. These look kind of flattish. This looks kind of flattish. This has got structure. Do, and the question is, what planets are they? Well, first one is Mars. Well, second, third one is Venus. So those are rather similar. What's this one that's blue? What do you think? Earth. Earth, right. And it is Earth. The point is spectroscopy will tell us how to distinguish among these cases. Spectroscopy is the secret key. My husband used to say it puts the fizz in astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a, a big blow up of the Earth's uh, spectrum, and we determined it, as I recall, from reflected light from the moon. Uh, and we don't know what we're going to see on exoplanets, but we know how to, we know we want to go after it, right? But how do you go after it? You have a star and this planet passing in front. Let's take a look. Here's a big bright star. Stop. If I could just put a thumb there, I'd be able to see the little faint planets on the outside. I'll let this go one more time. No, I won't. Try going back on its life. Yep. <laughs> I wanted you guys to be able to see it, see if it goes again. Here you go. It blocks the light, and now you see three faint stars. Okay? And so that's called coronography. It's basically launching the thumb. Uh, and if we could do that, we might actually be able to see the stars rather than infer them. Okay. Can Let's you build see. something like a, uh, the equivalent of a coronagraph? Yes. In the James Webb. Yes, it has okay. one. Oh, okay. And we already do this on Earth. Let's take a look at an example on Earth. Here is the Earth. This tiny little dot compared to our sun shows you how hard the problem is. Blocking out the light from the sun so you can see this little flea speck, right? Here is a Keck telescope observation of a star. Let's see how they did it, because they used a coronagraph. It has three exoplanets. Obvious, right? No. Wait. Oh. It's coming should be coming as PowerPoint, I don't know for sure. There you go. When you use the chronograph, you can have a shot at actually looking at the individual exoplanets. And James Webb does have a chronograph. Pretty good, right? All right, so what's next? So maybe what we can see, this is a simulation of what a JWST um, <coughs> would see if it were looking at this particular target, and the black lines are the actual measured uh, spectrum. 
All right. So I just want you to, we're about to wrap up now. I just want you to see how far along we actually are. Uh, this is the optic, the real optic, not the fake optic, not the model, the real deal, beautiful, gorgeous gold uh, on real people. <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about this, but I wanted to give you a slide in case you want to look for the four instruments. This one is near cam. This one here is near spec, one of my personal favorites, and I'll show you why. It puts a mask out so that it can let lots of individual galaxies through and take a spectrum of each one separately. How does it do that? A it's totally that previous picture. Sorry? Um, this one? Yeah. I assume that they're wearing the suits for keeping dust and other things out. Is there any issue? I know you're not landing on planets, but is there any issue about uh, human DNA or human molecules somehow getting out into space as a result of this? We don't feel that these uh, missions are an issue, but planetary missions, yes. Of They're, course. So those we actually have uh, safeguards in place in the whole committee that actually examines whether or not you're going to contaminate the environment. That's why I was a little concerned about sending one of those cars into space. I was wondering if it was a clean car. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing I thought. <laughs> so this is just basically keeping, keeping the telescope clean. Yes, yes. Because, as you will see in a moment, I'm about to show you an instrument where uh, a human here is gigantic compared to this. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to ask the technicians to stop breathing. <laughs> but you do ask them to wear bunny suits and everything else so you can try to keep the environment clean. Okay, so this is the one I like, that is the uh, configurable one. We take a spectrum of the sky, there are lots of things coming in, I want to separate them out. So what we do is we make, put a, a grid full of shutters and then open the preferred shutters so we let the light through galaxy by galaxy or object by object. This is the grid and they, they show you it's configurable by sticking in a pattern so that you can see that. Once I saw this, I realized that it actually looks like um, hockey players <laughs> in front of a JWST. I don't understand why they don't have a heart with my initials, but go figure. <laughs> and this is the grid size, and the size of a human hair is the circle. So you can see why dropping hair on it would really not be a good thing. And the last one here was nearest, the Canadian instrument, which is a, a grism type instrument, very similar to the grating and a prism. And MIRI, the mid-infrared, uh, that takes you to an even longer wavelength. That's the regime in which the dust will start to glow and make gorgeous pictures. Okay, so here's the actual mirror being um, uh, placed into Marshall Space, uh, excuse me, Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Here's the instrument package. This is the backside of where the mirrors are, where the instruments go. This I wanted to show you. Remember the Apollo program we talked about? Here we are at Johnson. This is actually Chamber A at Johnson, that hole in the background. The door is open, so that's the door. Here's a, pa a sort of a pallet structure that's getting ready to hold the optic and the detectors to be putting it into the vacuum, close the door, put it under vacuum, and test. And it was the only one in the United States big enough to accept a payload that big. And it had to be cleaned out and refurbished and brought back on because it was a historic historic artifact, as I understand it. And here's an example of the sun shield deployed with a, a real human being to give you a, an idea of the, of the size. Finally, Space Telescope, where I come from. It's going to be operated, the mission's going to be operated from there, as well as the science operations. And this is the control room that we built on the third floor. And those are actual people, and I think I know who he is, and he's not an operator. All right. <laughs> Uh, and so that's pretty much the end of it. That's all I wanted to talk about today. If you have questions, I'd be happy to take questions. You, you didn't mention the cost overruns. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the trouble. I mean, it's, yes. It's in trouble still. Yes, it is. It's in trouble for a different reason, but it is. Yeah. Man, I'm used to trouble. <laughs> so uh, the original cost, this is my opinion, and... Uh, my opinion of the original cost overrun was fundamentally having to do with how it was budgeted. You need, for a big project of this size, you actually need the right profile, you need a lot of reserves, okay? And the normal um, default number these days is 30% for each year, okay? So 30% reserve profile. And the reason for that is when things happen, and things do happen, 
You need to be able to fix it then in order to stay on schedule. If you defer any work to save 100 bucks, 100 bucks worth of work deferred costs 300 in the end. And so you, you run into a problem if you don't budget it ideally, and that was one of the fundamental things. There's always going to be technical problems, particularly on missions of this size, because usually you have to solve a lot of new technology. It's not always developed before you agreed to launch a mission. It has to be developed fully before the mission launches. There were at least nine miracles that had to happen, and they did, in order to, for it to, to, to be baselined. Now, what's going on now is, uh, from what I can tell, and I, I have lived up here now for three years, so I'm not in close contact, What's now is the normal stuff that I am used to. The normal stuff is, really? <laughs> you did a shake test and, you, and, and a screw came loose, right? I mean, you're going to launch this thing. You cannot have a loose screw. If it sets you back a few months, it's not the screw that's the problem. It's that it might happen again. And so that, those are the technical things that I am used to seeing on a program. And so I'm less worried about those because those are not indigenous to the fabric. Um, but it did overrun badly, and it is delayed badly, and for that, I just hope it turns out to be worth it. I, I trust but that it will. Congress is looking at it. Yes, directly. and they revalidated it, that they re, they're okay with sending it forward. Okay. Yeah. I vaguely remember that for the moon landing, yeah. uh, there was discussion about whether the problems were engineering or science. And at the time, I was told that it was basic, they basically understood the science, but they had trouble getting the engineering all right within 10 years. Yep. In, in this case, yep. is, it a, is it a similar kind of a thing where they understand the science, but just the engineering is really hard? You have to understand how NASA works. We don't, I'm not really a NASA employee. They don't do, they do one-offs. <laughs> they just don't do something that's not, they do the impossible. So of all the things you launch, you're always up here, and you, you, you know, it, it's, it's complicated. And so, usually you can't assemble a mission with parts found around that are normally available, and they're not space qualified. So, I guess my answer to that is, well, the engineering, like engineering is engineering then. Yeah, of course, yeah. But the engineering is the implementation. The, the, there are cases right. where you do have to look at science issues. For example, where Space Telescope adds value, I think, is they look at the possibility I'll uh, give you, for instance, you have 18 hexagonal mirrors. What if one of them doesn't, you know, what, what if one of the movement uh, freedom, degrees of freedom goes away? Is it impossible to, to focus? No. What we did was we studied it and w was an engineering student. We studied it and we discovered that you can actually lose five of them, depending on which five, but you yeah. can lose five and still be fine. Right. Okay. So that's where the science and the engineering play together, but the truth is you're still at the cutting edge where <coughs> unfortunately, in my experience personally, my life, uh, experience is recognizing a mistake when you make it again. Okay, things happen. And a lot of what's happening, in my opinion, <coughs> is that we are now, it's no longer the Apollo era where we're going to the moon in 10 years. We're now, there's much less budget, there's much less flight rate than we sort of are used to. And to some degree, you can go, you're training new generations who haven't, at certain stages, haven't done some of the stuff before, and human mistakes can also happen. Yeah. Yes, and there you were two other questions there. Back. International funding, we mentioned Canada and Europe. Yes. Are they contributing funds? Yes, they, uh, they contributed instruments and the Ariane uh, launch vehicle, and they are contributing personnel the, who oh. work at the Space Telescope Science Institute will become part of that, will work formally. The, the Canadian uh, scientists are already working. The, uh, European scientists are present there and will become part of our integrated team after launch. Yep. There was another question back here. Yeah, can you describe the arc of this project, when it started, what the original budget was, and how long <laughs> people thought it would take originally? Yeah. How much work went into planning before they even said go? So uh, that's one of the few things that's before my time. <laughs> so I came along, I didn't come along until 2007. Um, so, it, so, but I do have experience with how great observatories get started. They start as a concept. I took the slide out that shows the back of the envelope sketch, right? But, um, and, and then they get validated by the decadal survey. Then they get studied in some detail. An estimate gets made. It's not until you actually get confirmed that you actually have a budget and a launch date. 
And so in principle, actually, James Webb didn't have a budget launch date until 2009. But all the estimates that came before are WAGs that come from some other mechanism, but it's not formally adopted by NASA, I believe, until confirmation. So, so when was the concept made? Oh, okay. it would be, usually the concept comes much before. Uh, in this particular case, I can find out, but I don't happen to know, but I think it was late 80s. Oh, late 80s. If either yeah. that, or it could be late 90s. It could be, it was after Hubble launch, but you always start thinking about the next one right. shortly right. after, because it takes, in my experience, a quarter of a century to come to fruition, so you have to be thinking. But I can find out for sure, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was shortly after Hubble launched, or, you know, I can't, I'm making that up. I would like to go back to your question yeah. about engineering and science. Now, my own experience in telescope design and all those things, it's a artificial separation, because yes. we have to do yes. the engineering first. Yep. We find out yep. it doesn't match the science. Yes. It can't be done that yes. way. So it's a mutual back and forth yes. and sideways. So and one of the most uh, difficult things for space uh, optics mm -hmm. is you can't test it on the ground. <laughs> so you have to do the science, what yeah. happens when it's cold, mm -hmm. when the sun shines on it, when it's shaken and all these type of things. So it's a mutual agreement to solve the problem. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. In fact, we actually have a, a phrase for that. It's called science systems engineering. The science drives the design. We did it here. We had a science goal, look at the most distant galaxies. We made the design from that. The engineering then follows. But it, it is an integrated whole. It can't be separated, right? And so you're right. We call it science systems engineering. And the real figure of merit is, you know, how will it impact the science? And how much will it degrade it if I make this choice, for example? Or will it, will it fail to work? If you throw, for example, I'll give you an instance. For instance, uh, James Webb has uh, uh, like fluid in it, right, for orienting and for getting out to L2 and, or and changing its orbit and being just right. The problem is if you, if you slosh when you turn, that coronagraph won't work, mm. okay? And so we actually sat down, it's a science issue, how long do you have to wait for it to settle down? Will you not be able to do cor coronagraphy every time you point? wait a minute, that's going to be very inefficient. So we worked with the engineers and thought it through and realized you have to stick baffles in there in order to be able to, to do this properly. So that's a perfect example of what you're talking about. It's and not the, unusual. And the fact is, does it work? Yes. And that's <laughs> yeah. a simple question. Yeah. And if you're going to throw something overboard, how, how much will it impact the science? Because every now and then you do have to do descopes or consider descopes. Yes? What is the expected life of James Webb? Ten years is the uh, goal. And it may have enough um, to be able to go for 11 or 12. A, a lot of what you want to do is very smart, not only smart station keeping, smart momentum management. And the Space Telescope Science Institute, the Operations Center, will actually consider uh, the how to observe to preserve the life and to maximize the efficiency. That's part of the equation that goes into choosing where you're going to look in the does sky. It, does it need fuel to keep station? Yes. It does need fuel to keep stationary. I mean, did, did you have a question over here? Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the communication system? Um, what uh, is it built on the existing deep space it network is. system that yes. NASA runs? It is. And uh, we will be able to download frequently. At first, we, we had a, uh, the idea would be to uh, you store up your data, and then you drop it when you have an allowed uh, data drop. But they've actually upped the number of data drops that we're going to be allowed in order to be able to accommodate. Some of the data is going to be very data intensive. And so we want to be able to manage that. That also goes into the equation as the operations center of if I have a very data intensive observation, how am I going to segue that with when it, when it dumps? And maybe I'm going to do with, with uh, something else that's, that's not so data intensive. I know you talked about solar panels. Is that your only source of power, or do you have? Nuclear on no, it? No, we don't. Else? We don't have nuclear. That's it. And I would, before I forget, you guys are welcome to come up and take a look at this, or I'll pass it around. This is, by the way, a grading that um, is a, an engineering model of one that flew in space on Chandra. I was part of the team that built it. The reason why it's interesting, you can see through it's a little gold foil. What's interesting about it is that the grading bars on it, you can't see them. There's just a support mesh, are actually closer together than a wavelength of visible light. 
So it was a whole big design issue to do it. You had another question. Uh, what dictates the, the longevity of the spacecraft? The uh, propellant, the, um, the stuff to, to do station keeping. That's going to eventually run out and won't be able to station keep. And as I mentioned, it's a saddle point, so this thing needs to be sort of controlled at L2. You haven't been to Kepler now. Yeah, Kepler. Out it's out. Fuel. We're out of fuel. Yeah. Got another one that replaces it, Tess. Tess, yeah, Tess is somewhat different, but uh, Tess is going to be an awesome finder scope for James Webb. It's going to look for nearby candidates we could look at, I think. That's a pers pedestrian here, perspective. The Hubble, Hubble launched in 1990, so yep. it's like 18, 10, 20 years. Yeah, I was I was interim director when it celebrated the 25th anniversary. <laughs> just to say, glad I lived through it. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Yeah. So I, I was just looking on the on the web about the the timeline of, of, of James Webb. It actually started in, uh, the it was proposed in 1996. 96. So so six years so, after the launch of. So it has a lifespan of yeah. say 30 yeah. years between the idea and the launch, or a little less. Yeah. And if it's only good for, I mean, if it's going to be there for 10, 12 years, yep. are there three other projects in the works? So we're scientists, so we don't, we know nothing about constraint. <laughs> <laughs> right. I used or to be, watch three of them. Just space I them used out. to be a roadmap chair, and I thought a $30 billion roadmap was cheap. <laughs> so, um, but yes, the answer is yes. You always think about, oh, I have slides to show you. This is a gleam in the eye of the beholder. This is not, this is not baselined, nor is this uh, particularly sanctioned by the community yet. It's just a concept, but I can introduce you to one of the concepts that we want to think about for the future. Remember those exoplanets that we're looking at? Finding one would be wonderful that we could really characterize well. Maybe looking at five would be good, but James Webb won't be able to answer the question, is there life, you know? A habitable planet out there. You got to look at 50, 60, and you got to get the spectrum of them, and yada, yada, yada. We actually have a concept on board where you can have a 12 meter optic. It sees the galaxies at the building block level throughout the universe, okay, that is completely transformative for astrophysics, I think, and is designed to unambiguously answer the question by looking at enough of them, characterizing enough of them. It's a design criterion. How big does it have to be to, in order to do the problem? You know, the same design that we discussed here. If that was the problem we wanted to solve, we'd come up with something like that. Now, there are three other wonderful concepts getting ready to be discussed at the Decadal. One of them is called Lynx, which is this awesome X-ray observatory. And there are others. So it's just an idea. The community thinks inspiring thoughts for science. And they propose to do them. But you know, sometimes the technology limits you, and certainly the money is an issue. And you have to understand, Hubble is serviceable, but generally speaking, the missions that are launched are not serviced. It's very expensive to keep an astronaut program to service. And if the science requires you to go to L2, that's a whole other problem, right? So. Yeah, you you mentioned that you're using Marquette Telluride. Yes. But you use you get different formulations for different. Um, yes. For, okay, for, for the different pieces of the spectrum. Why did you choose not that? For, for the, maybe not the different well, pieces. Well, I yeah. mean, yeah. it's a different different composition for NIR and, and, and far infrared, I know. Yeah, I, I, I can't recall exactly yeah. the details of how of the detectors. Yeah. It may be in some of those slides that I, I didn't want really to touch it on. It was, I think it was back more. a ways it was considered yeah. a somewhat unstable, uh, yeah. a somewhat unstable material. Yeah. It's, is, is, has that been corrected, or sure. if you go ways? Yeah, yeah, it's, there's been a couple of decades that I, I have to check to make sure yeah. of what I, whether I'm even remembering correctly, I'm so yeah. sorry, but it's been a long time. Um, but detector uh, development has been going on for a number of decades now, yeah. in, the, in, you know, ground-based in the field, not necessarily just astronomy. But I, but I will say that all the detectors you launch, they still, you know, this is not, you know, a camera from Best Buy. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's difficult, no matter how it is. In uh, uh, my technological community that I came from is X-ray astronomy. 
we have to build those detectors. We actually go to synchrotons to measure the absorption lines and the features. The gratings are built, the optics are built. You have to design how to do it because it's not in the industry. And, and when you finally get an optic like that and detectors like that and you take them down and test them, you go, what? You find features that have never been seen on Earth before because they've never had an optic like that before. Mm -hmm. I saw it in both detectors, both the CCDs and the microchannel plates exhibited features that had never been seen before mm -hmm. and they had been tested for decades. So, new uh, well, I'm not know. surprised at 40 degrees. Oh no, this, in this case, this was just on the ground. Okay. Right? It was the optic. Nobody had an optic like that until then. Yeah. That's the beauty of all this, this what you're doing. This is a spin-off to industry yeah. for products. Yeah. I mean, this happened on the Apollo, it happened on a whole space product. So we benefit as yes. a country yes. to get all these spin-offs and then companies come and develop it and we, we use it today. Yeah, it's true. And J James Webb also has spin-offs, including medical for uh, the optics have spun off into medical. There's not only spin-offs, there's the inspiration factor of NASA science missions. It turns out that uh, NASA is the big attractor into engineering. And uh, Northrop Grumman loves NASA science because that's where it gets its engineers to begin with. That's where you get hooked. I want to work on a NASA mission, and you know people do. And you need, you need your technical people for defense and for communications and for all kinds of things, not just the strong. Yeah, for the military, everybody benefits. Exactly. Military, commercial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have, you know, integrated circuits. All yep. every all right. the technology. Oh, so was not in space. Hey, every time I, my plane lands correctly with GPS, I thank Einstein. <laughs> 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 all right. So I, I'm happy to talk to you all afterwards, and if. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.